all say hi to Ariana. Do y'all know her? <laughs> and this is her husband, this guy here, uh, this little guy here, that's her husband. These guys uh, were living in a mobile home park out in Reedville, and um, when we were starting the church over at the old San Marcos High School, which is now a Goodnight Middle School, and a guy and his wife lived in a mobile home park that were going to the church plant, and they went door knocking, and, uh, and they would prayer walk around that mobile home park, and they would, then they went and knocked on doors and invited everybody to go to church. And I don't know about the rest of the people lived there, but these two were just married. They were newlyweds. They were, one of y'all or both was still in college, weren't y'all? So they were making it. They were paying their own bills, uh, going to college. They're great people. And that's when I first met them. It was about the first month that the church started. So, by the way, if anybody cares, this is our third year anniversary in this building today, right now. I didn't really realize that till the other day. So, but the church has been around like 17 years. But anyway, they've been with us that long. And um, an interesting thing has happened in the last few months is that God's really began to anoint Ariana with this kind of ministry for leading us in worship. Amen. And uh, y'all agree with that, don't you? So what we did all summer was try to figure out what is God doing, which way is God going. And we feel like that... Um, that Ariana's supposed to be our new worship director. So we're not we're not really into one, you saw it this morning, one rock star up here. You saw how it came at you from three or four different angles. That's kind of what we're into, but we need a leader. We need a director. And God's hand seems to be on Mike and Ariana for this thing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to move forward with it, but we also value the relationship. So we don't ever want to get in a position where we get cross-threaded or, wow, this, you know, we thought this and failed expectations. So we're going to go slow with it. So we're going to do a three-month, uh, the worship team doesn't even know this, I don't think, but it's officially, but I believe it's a long-term deal. So I haven't made much of it, but I felt like I should mention it to you guys because I need you guys uh, to be a part of this thing is that for the next three months, we're going to give it a shot. And if at the end of three months, if Mike and Ari don't feel like it's a fit for them, then we want to be able to hug and be best friends and say, cool, we, we did what God told us to do at that point. I'm, we're both kind of feeling like it's a longer term deal, but, uh, but I just felt like I should mention that. But, uh, so that's where we're going from now until February 1, but I think it'll be a longer term deal than that. But if it's not, we, we love them and value them, and we're going to stay in great relationships. So this is kind of a, 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 an easy safety valve for, all, for everybody involved. Anyway, I think it's a good idea. Some of y'all are in leadership and your work and stuff. You might steal that idea from me and put it into work in the marketplace because I guarantee it'll work. Um, but anyway, we want to pray for her. So let's get you in the middle, and let's get all the worship team to get a hand laid on her if we can. I'll get back behind everybody. And... Um, uh, let me see here. Where's that handheld mic? Get that because I think Casey's supposed to pray too. Casey, I'm going to have you pray and then I'm going to pray. Now, church, this is where you get involved. I need your support. I need you guys to support Ariana and the thing, that, new thing that God's doing in her and her family because this affects her kids. This affects her schedule. Would you guys stand up if you can and aim your charismatic, you're already doing it, your charismatic power beam at them. Casey, would you lead us and then I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we sure thank you for your... Um for how you provide in every different way, God. And you have provided this church with an amazing worship leader um, in Ariana and in Micah, that their hearts are both mm -hmm. hearts uh, that are just geared to worship hard for you. They both sacrificed on this worship team for many years, God. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we want to honor that. We want to mm -hmm. honor what they've already done mm -hmm. and bless it moving forward, God. And I just pray over Ariana and Micah both, a fresh anointing of the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit, God. A fresh just washing over that, that, that their prayers get deeper and stronger, that their quiet time um, just grows and, and produces new fruit that they've never experienced before, God. Mm. I pray that, that their family would be connected at new levels, mm. God. That you would bless their children. That you would bless their finances. That you would bless Mike at his work, God. And yes. that he would have favor at yes. AAA, God. That you would open up the doors so he can attend every meeting mm. here to help lead. And God, we pray for Ariana that you would just continue to birth in her new songs of praise. Mm -hmm. That she can just prophesy over this congregation. Mm -hmm. That every word that you give her would be a prophetic word and anointing mm -hmm. that would cover us and bless St. Marcus mm -hmm. Community Church. That we would grow in worship because of her leadership, mm -hmm. God. 
We honor you for what you're doing, Lord. We thank you for a faith in transition. Mm. And we bless it in Jesus' name. Father God, we just come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, and we just call forth every prophetic word that's ever been spoken over either Micah or, or Ariana or their family. We believe that decisions like this to enter into a new ministry assignment have a generational, generational uh, results. And I pray for their kids. I pray for everything that's going on. I believe that they are following you in this. And, uh, and, and we agree with that. We agree with that. And so as a church, we bless them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We bless them to their new ministry assignment. And Casey's already prayed it out. Open heavens, open hearts, new revelation. But, but more than that, he's right too. It affects the whole thing, the finances, everything. We pray for their marriage. We thank you for strong marriages. We thank you for, for healthy families. Great role. They're a great role model to us. But we bless them financially, relationally, spiritually, every other way. We bless them. In the name of Jesus, we're looking forward to dancing together for this next three-month thing. We're hoping it's longer than that. But Lord, we're taking it one step at a time. Thank you, Jesus. We bless them. Amen. Amen. All right. Y'all give them a hand. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. All right. Well, what a great day. John, why don't you just come up here? You guys got a special treat today. You get to hear from Big John Z, man. And he, I think, are those new shoes? About a year old. About a year old. I thought they were new. His shoes look cool, man. Look at him. He's a cool looking guy. God bless you, buddy. I appreciate Talk to it. us. Man, do I even need to preach today? We already had church, pretty much. Uh, my name is John Zmickley. For those of you who don't know me, um, I am um, associate pastor here and uh, youth pastor. Um, I came across this really cool prayer um, that I thought I'd share with you guys. It says this, Dear Lord, so far I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. I'm really glad about that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. And from then on, I'm going to need a lot more help. (laughs) Anybody ever say that prayer in the morning? Yeah. Um, I say that because uh, today we're going to study a scripture that covers uh, Jewish prayer that that Jewish people say in the morning and in the evening. It's called the Shema. Um, And this prayer is found in Deuteronomy, and I'm going to read it to you, and you've probably heard it before. Deuteronomy, if I can find it here, uh, 6, 4 through 6, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And that is um, what Jesus reiterates um, in today's Uh, gospel reading, and I want you guys to actually open up to that one, and that is going to be in Mark 12. And Mark 12, verses 28 through 34 is what I'll be reading. And if you don't have a Bible, you got one under your seat, um, page 1011, 1011. You can probably throw that up there if you would on the screen. Curtis is there, so... The rest of you should be too. (laughs) So uh, Mark 12, uh, I'll start reading at at verse 28. Jesus says this, or well, the Bible says this, One of the scribes came and heard them arguing, and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, The foremost is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, right teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and there is no one else besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After this, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. So this is Jesus reiterating 
the fact that this is what a scribe is asking. We have all the Torah, we have the whole commandments, the Ten Commandments, but we also have all these Levitical commands uh, that we have to be following. But it's kind of like that scenario if the house is burning down, you run in to grab a few things, what are you going to grab? There's a lot of things you could grab, right? There's a lot of things that you could probably pick up. But what are the, you know, few five things that you can carry with you that will take you through every situation? Um, you know, those old photographs, old letters from loved ones, or whatever it may be. Where should we be focusing? And not to say that all of God's commands, uh, any of God's commands are small. But to here to say, Jesus is himself saying there is a great commandment. There is what's called the greatest commandment. Um, and he focuses on this one. And so um, that's what I want to talk about today. Jesus says all of the law can be summed up by this great commandment. And so it's important for us to get this right. <laughs> uh, and so that's what I want to talk about today. Um, you know, the greatest commandment, loving God with our full heart, with our full soul, with our full mind, and with our full strength. And um, it sounds so simple, <laughs> you know, it's just one sentence, but it's so profound, you know, and it, and it sounds easy in a way because, well, that's all I have to do, but it takes your whole life, <laughs> you know, it, it, it lasts your whole life to figure this stuff out. Was that a thunderclap? <laughs> the power of God right there. Boom, I should have timed that right. Um, but... It's basically love God with everything you have, everything that you have. And so what does that mean? So I want to go through these, um, these three slash four different points that Jesus makes and God made uh, back in the Shema there. So uh, number one is love God with all your heart, okay? Um, the word heart uh, in the Hebrew language is lev or levav, um, and it's more than just an organ in your body. The heart in, in Hebrew scripture is more than just a feeling of love. You know, we say we love with our heart um, or we physically have a heart. But the cultures at this time, especially in the time of Israel, did not understand uh, the meaning of the brain, actually. They, didn't, they thought that you thought with your heart. You felt with your heart. Basically, all of your life was carried in the heart. In Esther 6.6, 6, it says, Haman thought in his heart. In Deuteronomy 8.5, it says, thus you are to know in your heart. In Proverbs, it says, wisdom dwells in the heart. Solomon discerned in his heart between truth and error. So we don't have, they didn't have a concept of thinking in our brains. At the time, they thought in their heart. Also, um, it was also, and that's also why in, in the old scripture, it says in your heart, in your soul, and in your strength. But later in the Gospels, it talks about the heart, the soul, the mind, and the strength. And the mind then was separated from the heart because they kind of understood it a little bit more. But back in the Hebrew Scripture, there was no mention of mind. It was all in the heart. So beyond the, the thinking, you know, thinking in your heart and, and putting your mind towards the things of God, there's also this emotion of your heart, which we all know. You love with your heart right? Um, it said in, 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 um, when Hannah couldn't have any children, it says that she felt pain in her heart. Um, and that's where we get the idea of a broken heart. Um, the Bible describes fear as to be felt in the heart, um, but also joy. We have joy in our hearts, right? Isn't that a song? We have joy, joy, joy down in our hearts, something. Uh, and love, of course. Um, but beyond emotion and intellect, we also make goals in our heart. We aspire to be more than we are in our hearts. David had it in his heart to build a temple of God. The uh, Bible talks about us having the desires of our heart. So all these things are basically all inward expressions and thoughts and feelings and desires. Basically, he's saying, let all of your inward focus be on God. Love God with your whole, your inward emotions. Um, and so... Loving God with all of your heart, Jesus isn't saying it's not just an emotion, fall in love with God, although that happens. He's saying with your whole life, love him with everything that you have. I was reading some commentary and it says this, to love him with our heart is to set our affections on him. Let our own desire towards him and take a delight in him. And he is one Lord, therefore he must be loved with our whole heart as he has the sole right to us and therefore ought to have sole possession of us. And this is a daily decision to give our everything to Jesus. 
It's not just when you first believe, you know, we, we say we give our hearts to Jesus, but it's a daily, daily task. And, and, and you have to be proactive on giving your heart to Jesus every day, giving your emotions to Jesus every day, giving your thoughts to Jesus every day. It's a daily battle because um, it says in Proverbs, guard your heart because it flow, out of your heart flows your whole life. And if we know that, the devil knows that too. And the devil's trying to get at your heart all the time, you know, break your heart and, and make you see things the way that God, you know, is not, you know, that God's a bad guy or that God's trying to out to get you or, or whatever may happen. Um, the devil's at your heart as well. And it's a hard thing because, you know, when we first give our lives to Jesus, we're like, God, take it all, take our whole lives. And that's what happened to me. Um, but after a while, after a few weeks, things started coming back into my life, things like temptations or problems, and, and, and it happens. That's a decision that we have to make, you know, daily. Um, and so just to be a little bit vulnerable with you guys, vulnerable, um, I uh, am, if you've talked to me for any length of time at all, you probably know that I'm from Michigan. Um, <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. And I moved here in 2000, and so is Marilyn and a few others. I moved here in 2006 seven, to study at Texas State University. My goal, my inward desire and plan was to be here for two years. Um, and, um, and as it was time for me to start leaving, you know, at the end of semester, I was getting ready to graduate, move back to Michigan. God started doing something in my heart to say, stay. And um, around that time, at the same time, Pastor John approached me about doing a potential internship here. Texas State University offered to uh, offered me a part-time job as well, and it was confirmation of what God was doing in my heart to say stay. And I'm not going to lie to you and say that, you know, I, you know, it was in my plan because it wasn't, but every year it's been, okay, another year, another year, another year, and in my mind, in my heart, I still have this idea that someday I'll move back. And so last summer, um, and I hate that unsettledness of, of, you know, you know, where am I going to go, God? What am I going to do? Tell me everything. And so last summer, um, I just, I took about a month where I went up to Michigan and I was really seeking God and praying, you know, I, I don't want to be divided in my heart. And so um, in the end, I went up north and I felt like God said to me, I, I, I said, God, what do you want me to do? How long do you want me to be in Texas? You know, I love it in Texas. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I love everyone in this church. I love my job. I love everything I do. But that feeling of like, I also love my family. I wish I could be there, you know, for them and with them. And so I just gave God my heart and I said, what do you want, Lord? Um, tell me where to go. And he told me, basically, um, he affirmed me at this church. He affirmed me at Texas State. He affirmed me in everything I'm doing. And he said, if I wanted you here, I would have told you by now. I would have had a way and made a way for you to be back. It's good that you're there. It's good that you are where you are. And it settled things in my heart. When I came back, I was like, yes, okay, I'm settled. I'm where God wants me. But it's that constant, you know, as a, as a Christian, we have desires of our hearts, you know, but we also have to make sure that they match with his desire. And when we spend time in his presence, he gives us his heart. And, and I, I'm telling you, I couldn't be more happy where I am now and, and who's to say, if I did follow my heart and go back up there, there'd be nothing there for me. You know, God would bless me, probably, you know, just because he's a good God. But, you know, it's at the same time, it's this constant need, you know, that we have daily to give our hearts to God in every single way. And in my opinion, the best solution and the best way to make sure that my heart matches up with God's heart is through worship. And when we worship the Lord, we exchange our messy hearts, our broken hearts, our walled up hearts for his, his heart of flesh, his heart of, of, of peace, and his heart of joy. Um, and so when we neglect worship, when we, that's what we did this morning, I mean, you may have woken up, well, you got an extra hour of sleep, so you probably woke up kind of happy. But, you know, sometimes we wake up on the wrong side of the bed, but when we spend time in worship, I'm sure most of you, if you took a survey, how you felt before you went to worship and afterwards, uh, you would have seen a huge change, right? Um, and that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that when you love God with your full heart and always put it on the throne of, of God, 
your inward desires, feelings, and, and, and love and everything. He's saying this is far greater than any burnt offerings or following every letter of the law. Uh, it says in Hebrews 9, when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is of, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. And what that's saying is God's not looking for us to sacrifice physical things or to put in our time or to, you know, just do things to please him. He just wants your heart. That's all he wants. You know, and so that's what we do when we go to worship. Um, he doesn't want our dead works. Um, our job is to meditate and worship him. This is how we fight our battles. We sang that song last week, right? We fight our battles through worshiping him because he can only, um, you know, take care of our problems. But this is how we get renewed. Through worship, God gives us a renewed mind, a renewed heart. Worship will change your perspective on a situation, Problems suddenly seem so small, right? Um, worship will change the way you see a person. You'll suddenly start seeing them in a whole new light. Forgiveness will start coming over your heart if you have unforgiveness. And worship is not a song. Worship is a lifestyle, right? It's not just in this room at this time. It's a meditation. It's a constant holding up your heart to God and saying, God, you have my whole inward thoughts. Give me a renewed mind. And, and it has to happen daily. It's not just once. And so this is how we love God with our whole heart, is we, we offer it up to him. And it's cool to think that that's how we love God. We say, how do I love God? Well, it's, you, you just hold your heart up to him spiritually. So God didn't stop there, and I think that's kind of a piece of the thing, is that how, how do we follow and, and, and follow through with this greatest commandment? Love God with your whole heart. Give your all to him, all the time, every day, inside. But he doesn't stop there. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul. And I combine those two. Well, actually, it's just the soul, because mind is kind of with the heart. But the word soul, the second one, it's a Hebrew word that, me, that says, it's called nephesh, N-E-P-H-E-S-H, nephesh. It appears 755 times in the Old Testament, soul. And that is the English translation is soul. And that's kind of unfortunate because I think if I gave you all a survey and what is the definition of a soul, I'd probably get 200 different answers. <laughs> I don't think we really know and understand what soul means in the English language. I think we kind of think of this like non-physical, like ghost of us, like if we died, our ghost of inside of us in the physical body would go to heaven or something. We don't really have an idea. It's kind of a nebulous idea. But the way the Hebrews probably understood this word was actually a word meaning throat. <laughs> Believe it or not, throat. Um, it says when the Israelites were in the wilderness, they said their nephesh was dried up. Their throats were dry, kind of like mine is. Um, <laughs> Um, it can also, though, be used to describe a person's life, an entire life, and that is used about 117 times. Both humans and animals who had lives, who were living organisms, also were considered to have this nephesh in them. And I don't know if dogs really go to heaven, but I don't think that they really have souls in the way that we think of it. But in this regard, if they're a living, breathing being, they're an organism that has a soul, okay, a, li a life blood in them. And so in the Bible, most people don't have a nephesh, they are a nephesh. So it says in uh, Psalms 118, let me live that I may praise you. The direct translation is let my nephesh live that it may praise you. Let my heart, my life being, whatever makes me tick, that's your nephesh, your, your, your physical life, okay? So it's kind of like the, if the heart is your inward, putting your heart and your mind and your emotions on the, on the throne of God every day, your nephesh is kind of like putting your physical being of a human life on the throne of God every day too. Love God with all you do, love God with your humanness, love God with your living, your life, Okay, so kind of like your outward expression. So it's not just a mindset, because you can have a heart for God, but still not do what he says. <laughs> you, can, you can. You can think, well, I, I, I want to want you, God. I, and God may say something to you, but you don't actually act on it or do it. Have you ever been there? 
I have. You know, God says something, but our nefesh is like, not going to do that, you know? Um, so this is a process of what's called sanctification. Um, you have the capacity to love God with your hearts, but not yet fully give your full life, your full self to him. And that's a daily of, you know, a, a daily process, of not just putting your heart on the throne of God, but putting your actions and your, you know, your steps to it. Sanctification is a process where we slowly become more and more like Jesus, outwardly and inwardly. Um, it's a daily battle of God maybe convicting you in your quiet time, God saying something to you, and you actually walking it out. It's, a, it's, it's putting away fleshly desires and fleshly wants and fleshly, you know, comforts, and putting those aside and saying, no, I'm going to follow my heart in what God's saying, and I'm going to force my nefesh to live out what God wants it to do. So um, there's an example of, of this pretty recently. I, um, I'm a youth pastor here, and one of the kids in the, in the youth group was having a hard time, and I had been having some, not some issues, but, you know, we, we'd been going through a lot of different trials with this, with this kid uh, to the point where he ended up in the hospital. And I'd been praying, and I actually was working on a sermon um, the night, the day that I heard that he was in the hospital, and I was like, oh man, you know, he, something happened, and, and it was a mistake that he made that was not the smartest thing in the world to do, and so I was like, ah, oh, you know, I'll, so I was like, well, I'll pray from home and just pray that he gets better, and my heart, God, you know, was telling me, go, go to the hospital, and pray for him in person. Don't just pray at home. Go there. And I was like, no, I'm working on a sermon. God, you don't understand. I've got things to do. You know, I'm doing your work, you know. And so, but God was like, no, you need to go to the hospital. And I was like, ah, no, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So then a uh, hour goes by and his mom says, hey, um, thank you for praying, but would you come to the hospital? And I was like, ah, I shouldn't have to be asked to do that, I should have gone because God told me to go anyway. I was like, of course I will. And so I drove over and I was like, on the way there, I was just like, God, you know, I got things to do. This is so selfish. I'm sorry to say, but you know, I was like, I got stuff to do. I shouldn't, you know, you know, just anyway. So I, I ended up going there. I made it right in my heart all the way there. I was like, you know what? This is the right thing to do. I'm glad I'm finally doing it. So it's in your will. It's going to be good. So I get there. Uh, but I will say, while I'm writing the sermon, I couldn't really write a sermon because, you know, God was dealing with my heart. I couldn't get pen to paper or anything. And so I couldn't really feel like the presence of God was over that thing. And so I was like, well, maybe I just need to leave. And so I went over, and, and as soon as, I will say, as soon as I walked into the hospital room where the mother was, it's like God was waiting for me there. It's like I walked into the presence of God in this waiting room in the hospital, and I was like, this is what God wanted me to do this whole time. And I prayed, actually what ended up going is I prayed for the mother more than I prayed for the son, because she needed it more than he did, actually. And that was the real reason. But it's this daily obedience to what God's doing in your inner life is our souls, our, our nefesh, our, our, what makes us tick, our, our physical being has to also align with that too. And in that way, we love God with our whole bodies too. And so that's what it means to love God in your soul is to love God with your humanness. You know, um, I just heard this really cool um, um, sermon by Pastor Stephen Furtick at Elevation Church, and he said that humans are the only creatures that can give God a broken hallelujah. And what that means is the angels are giving him hallelujahs all day long, but when we're in our brokenness and in our pain and in our suffering, and we choose to follow him anyway, we say hallelujah anyway, nobody, no other creature on earth can give him that. And so I encourage you to, to put aside your desires and your wants for him and what he wants. Um, C.S. Lewis once said, and really, this is obedience. That's all it is. It's obedience. You know, it's not a burnt offering or sacrifice, really, in the way that this scripture is talking about. It's just flat being obedient to what God said, because it's the best way to live. Um, C.S. Lewis once said, obedience is the key that opens every door. 
When we simply trust and obey, we, doors get unlocked ahead of you, behind you, and you become more and more like Jesus. Jesus says, if you love me, you obey all that I commandment, commanded. And if you read that wrong, it's easy to think that obeying God is this dangling carrot. If you really love me, you know, you do what I tell you to do. You know, if you really did this thing for me, then I'll love you. But that's not what he's saying at all. If you, he's saying, if you follow me, it's a fruit of the fact that you love me. It's, it's proof. You know, if you look at your life and say, well, I haven't been obedient. Well, you have a love problem. You know, and so that's where it starts is it starts with love, loving God with your full heart. That's kind of step one, you know, and step two is, okay, follow that out. Um, And we will look more and more like who Jesus is making us to be. Um, When I first started here at the church, um, I started a year, about a year long internship. And um, Pastor John asked me to preach. And I said, no, (laughs) I was always afraid of it. I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to, you know, even just broach that topic. And very respectfully, he's like, okay, well, you know, all right, I respect that. And the next day, God just, as soon as, you know, I said, no, I knew that that's not what God would have me do. And God worked on my heart all the next day, and uh, Pastor John came to me again the next day. And he said, hey, um, about preaching, um, just asking for you to reconsider that. And as soon as he said that, I was like, you know what? God already worked on my heart, and I am so sorry that I said no, because I know that's what he was calling me to do. And I just, you know, we have, these, we have a choice to make every day to, to agree with what God's doing or not. And, you know, and I'm just thankful for John and, you know, in, 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 in stretching me and pulling me in that direction because I will say preaching has been one of the hardest things I've ever done, but also one of the most precious things to me because, you know, God does things in my heart that I don't think I would have done if I didn't do that. And so being obedient to what God's pulling me to do is actually turning me to be a lot more like Jesus because he's, he's forcing me to wrestle with scriptures and forcing me to think about, you know, things more deeply than just like, okay, heart, soul, spirit, mind, cool, got it, <laughs> to study them. Uh, and so I'm just so thankful for that. And, and, and the obedience, uh, you know, to say yes to God is really to say yes to looking more like Jesus. And he's not doing it to hurt us. He's doing it to help us and, and to satisfy us. And when we say no to those things, it's a good thing. Um, when we say no to ourselves and we say yes to him. And so um, the third thing that we see here is, is that, yeah, sorry. The third thing is that we love God, not just with our minds and our inward being and also our bodies, but third is our strength. Which, when you first read that, you think, okay, well, I can, like, focus on working out, right? <laughs> I, you know, you can go to the gym more and be like, yes, I'm going to love God with my strength. Uh, you know, it's easy to originally kind of think that. Um, you know, but beyond that, I think that, you know, that, that verse in Colossians came to my mind when I first read this. It says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. So whatever we do, do it with your strength. And that does take strength to follow through and to be obedient. There's a type of strength that you have to have, really, I think, to do that physically and, and spiritually. But the, the word here that they're using is not a physical strength. There is a Hebrew word for strength, and that's not the one being used. The one that's actually being used is this word called miod. M-E-O-D, meod, and it appears about 300 times, and what it means is much or very. So a direct translation would be like, love God with all your muchness. <laughs> love God with your very, which is a really interesting angle, um, because um, you wouldn't think that an amplifier or a word modifier would be used to describe our, how we're supposed to love God. Um, and the Jews later took this to interpret it as wealth. So if you're very blank, you're very wealthy. If you have a meod in, in the Jewish culture, you're wealthy. Greeks took this and said, if you have a meod, 
um, you are very strong physically, and you're very um, powerful physically. But the way this word is really translated is muchness. Love God with your muchness. <laughs> okay, that's cool, because it's, a, you know, we don't hear that every day. But mayot is a word that intensifies everything we do. It's the most wide and expansive word used here, actually. Um, you have a muchness to you. The way that God created you was not just to be a ho-hum, routine, boring person. May I say that? God made you to have a muchness to you, a personality to you, a strength to you, a power inside to you. And he gives you dreams and visions, and he wants you to be a co-creator with him. That's how he made us, to be image bearers. Just as he's a creator, he created us to be creative and dream and think and be a powerful person. You have a, a muchness to you. If you get in touch with that, with who God made you to be truly, a child of God, he made you not just as a drone, but a person with personality and with ideas that nobody else has. And that's awesome. You know, you are a powerful person. And some people need to hear that today. You have the power to overcome addiction. Just like we sang this morning, you know, every hopeless situation ceases to exist when he walks in the room. But you and of yourself, you have a power in you to take charge, as Pastor John said, of that situation and not be run over every time a temptation comes at you. You have a muchness and a, a very about you that God wants to, to stir in you to do God-sized things, to say, no, I'm not going to do that addiction anymore. I don't have to. Because I'm free and I'm powerful. Okay? You have the power to stand up for yourself against the devil. You have the power to do something nobody else has ever done. And uh, in my life, where I've experienced this is I am, I will say, addicted to my phone. Okay? Uh, I honestly, like, I'm looking at my phone into the night, scrolling through Instagram. I am texting, I, whatever. I'm up to the, watching a movie on my laptop and look, playing a game at night. And I just, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's a problem. So, uh, you know, I, a few days ago was like, I can't do this anymore. I hate, because as I'm trying to go to bed, my eyes are kind of already bugging, you know, and I'm thinking of all the things I just saw, like, you know, this person, you know, on Facebook or whatever. My mind's reeling a mile a minute, and I can't truly relax in my bed. So I was like, you know what? I did this during Lent a few years ago. I'm going to do it again. My room is now the no-phone zone. Okay, so I take my phone, I put it in the living room, I don't even touch it, and I will say for the last few nights, just being in my room is suddenly a peaceful place. You know, it's suddenly, when I get in there, it's a calm comes over me, I'm like, wow, this is awesome, because I'm, I'm turning on silent, it's in another room, and some of you already probably do this already, but, um, you know, I have an old school alarm clock that I dug up, and I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to do this. And I will say, I've had the best sleep of my life. I've had godly dreams. Um, you know, God woke me up in the middle of the night to remind me of something tonight that I didn't, I, I didn't notice, and I got the problem solved at midnight because, you know, it was something God was saying to me. And he, but but the, the fact is that so often we live our lives that yeah, it was because I didn't have a computer person, and the computer person's like, yes, I got that text at 2 a.m., <laughs> But I honestly wouldn't have, you know, uh, thought of that. But, you know, God reminded me. The Holy Spirit, I feel like he woke me up and he said this thing. But, you know, in a way, that phone was kind of taking away my, my strength, my mayod, my power. And I was giving my power to that thing. And I'm like, you know what? Now I have a mind, godly mindset. You know, at night I can go to beds better. And all that to say, I will not be controlled by this thing. I won't be controlled by words people say to me. I won't be controlled by anything because I have a power and a strength in me that God put in my heart. Of course, it comes from him, but we have the power to overcome addiction. You know, we, if we would just let our minds receive that, you have a personality and a muchness to you that nobody else has. Um, and a lot of men run away from this, you know, muchness, I guess, this strength of God out of fear. You know, if God has put something in your heart that's like a godly vision or dream or something great, 
Um, a lot of people kind of say no to that because they're like, oh, that's too big, that's too far-fetched, that's too much. Um, but I think we need to get in touch with this godly strength, this godly muchness. In, um, there's a book that's out there called Wild at Heart by uh, John Eldridge. And in that book, <laughs> Curtis is awesome. Uh, it's, uh, it's all about, uh, you know, um, uh, the heart of a man. And, and, and as a young man or as a even middle-aged man, it's a really great book to read. But in this book, John Eldridge was talking about a guy who was having a nightmare at night in which a ferocious lion was chasing him down until he finally dropped exhausted and woke up screaming in the night. And every, he'd have this recurring dream of a lion chasing him. And um, this pastor came to him and prayed with him through the dream. And this is what it said. It said, as they prayed, the, prayer, the pastor on impulse invited the man to recall the dream, even in its fear. Hesitantly, the man agreed and soon reported that indeed the lion was in sight and headed his way. The pastor then instructed the man, when the lion comes close to you, try not to run away, but instead stand there and ask who he is or what he is and what he's doing in your life. Can you try that? Shifting uneasily in his chair, the man agreed, then reported what was happening. The lion is snorting and shaking its head, standing right there in front of me. I ask him who he is, and oh, I can't believe what he's saying. He says, I'm your courage and your strength. Why are you running away from me? A lot of people, especially when it comes to getting the close things of God, the mighty, uh, powerful things of God, healings, um, great dreams of opening up orphanages or, or homeless ministry or something that God has put on our hearts, a lot, just as men, it's easy to run away from that in fear and say, oh, that's too much or that's too far. That outruns my, my theology. That's not for me. And I think there's a strength there waiting for you for God to, uh, not, not for you to run away from, but to embrace and I think uh, one quote that he says in here, he says, let people feel the weight of who you are and let them deal with it. <laughs> you know, get in touch with that strength and just live it out, you know, and it goes beyond just being obedient and, and you know, loving God with our full heart, with our full body, but also dream big and ask God what he might do and, you know, and see what kind of new things that you could create on this earth. There's a video I want to show um, it's about seven minutes long, and it's about this very thing. It's about a couple who basically gave it all up for, um, for more of Jesus and what he was calling them to do. So if y'all would, let's go ahead and roll that. Um, you know, even though I'd say we were, ha we were happily married and had um, a good family and, and um, were living a good life, you know, there was still uh, an emptiness in us, especially in me, that was... Uh, not being fulfilled uh, in my Christian walk. We both were raised in Christian families, and so we believed the Bible, but we had none of it in our life, and we, were, we would say, where's the more? You know, if this is really what it seems to be, where, where's the fruit? Where's the more? Where, where's the passion? Where's the love? They say you have to love God. How do you love God? I don't know how to do that. You know, I... I can accept him and say a prayer, but how do you, how do you fall in love with God? And, and you know, what does that mean? And what if you don't feel it? Can you still be a Christian? Can you still, you know? And we we would have these conversations. And so that night reminds me of the night that I met Mike. That's what I I kind of. It's the same kind of feeling that I had. It was like meeting Jesus for the first time. You know what the Lord did. Uh... You know, on the outside looked, you know, innocent enough and casual, but was very deep. So it is hard to describe, you know, what happened in, inside, you know, Dean and I, and, you know, there was just such a, an exchange where he, he took things, you know, from me. Uh, You know that you know I didn't deserve the forgiveness and and the deliverance, but things were just removed instantly and just replaced with radical love.
Well, that radical love would propel them to sell everything and fly to China with their three small children in two suitcases. No plan, couldn't speak the language, but God told them to go and they trusted him. So we just said, if he's asking us to go, then we're just gonna go. And so we sold our house and we gave everything else away. And uh, we just came with clothes and we moved here uh, with our three children. They were 18 months and five and eight at the time. And you had no home, we, no house? No house. We, we lived in a hotel for three days and um, found an apartment and um, was very interesting. It was, it was, it had rats and it had raw sewage and we didn't know anything. And I remember walking in and it was everything up until that point for me, it was very exciting. It was, even though there was a lot of sacrifice involved, but even the sacrifices were such a joyful sacrifice. It was like, it was all I had to give and I was just so happy to give it. But at that moment, as I stood in the apartment and I watched my I watched my children come in for the first time and see their new home. And I thought, what kind of mother does this to her children? You know, we had a beautiful home and a beautiful family. And it hit me, you know, like, this is real. You know, this is, this is real. And I saw their little faces, you know, just try and do the best that they could. And, and I just thought, oh my goodness, you know, what have I done? What they had done was put their lives completely in their father's hands and either he would have to come through for them or they were in big trouble. But then, Dina forged a relationship with some of the local orphanages and miracles began to happen and doors were open for them that never should have been opened and they began to receive children from these orphanages that no one else wanted, which, in just a short time, has led to this. Welcome to the home that love built. With hardly any regular funding and month-to-month -month financial miracles, Mike and Dina care for lame, blind, and mostly unadoptable children through their ministry, Loaves and Fishes. They give them an education, care for them, and pour out as much love as they physically can on children no one else deems worthy of love. These children are us, broken, unwanted, overlooked people, but the father shines through two people and suddenly the child's purpose is made clear. All that is expected of these kids is that they receive the love lavished upon them. Here is just one example of the more than 40 children Mike and Dina care for. This little boy was kidnapped from his parents and shipped into the country in a box for three days. The lack of oxygen gave him permanent brain damage. So, we, you know, with him, we've, we feel really honored to have him. We always, you know, think, what if our child was stolen? We know and heard so many stories of people who've had their children stolen from them, and what would we want? You know, of course, we would want to find them, but if we couldn't find them, we would want somebody to honor them, to love them, to care for them. And um, so we count it a great privilege to take care of him in, in the place of his family. When I asked Dina why she does this for children who won't be able to give anything back, I received an education as well. Right. Well, we believe that God is the giver of life and that if he chose for a life to be created, that there's purpose in the life. And um, these children have taught us more than probably some of the greatest teachers and preachers of our time about love. God has used them to change the way that we think, the way that we feel, and we're happy. And holding them, I feel God's presence. And holding them, I feel His pleasure. And holding them and loving them, even when they die in my arms, I feel His grace. 
why would he choose us to do this? I don't know, but there's this knowing that we're in the center of his will for our life. And we know we're only a piece of the puzzle. You know, we're one piece of this amazing puzzle that he's created, and we just want to do our part well. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. That looks a lot like the kingdom of God. Here's people who, you know, and that's what Jesus says, is you're not far from the kingdom. When you love God with your full heart as they did, they were just sick and tired of living these routine lives, and they gave their hearts to God, they gave their souls to God, and this is something God sized that only He could do, that He gave them only through obedience. And so what's cool about this is Jesus says the second commandment is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. You can't do that unless you love God with your full heart. You know, with every part of your heart, it leads to loving your neighbor as yourself. It leads to God-sized miracles and, and things happening in your life. So um, what I want to do is pray for you guys and um, this church. So if everybody would stand up, um, I want to pray for you. And um, <clears throat> I want to pray for a few different types of people, and then we're going to do communion here. But um, if you would just bow your heads. And the worship team can come on up. Um, I want to pray for people who need a change of heart. I want to pray for people who feel like they have a stone heart instead of a heart of flesh. Uh, I want to pray for people who um, feel like they haven't allowed God into every area of their heart. So if that's you, if there's an area of your heart, or if for the first time ever you want to give your full heart to Jesus, I would ask you to lift your hands up. If there's any part of you that you need to continue giving up and put on His throne, an em emotional situation, or, a, or, a, your, or, or you want God to change your mind, or if you want Him to do anything internally, I would ask you to just lift your hands up, and I'm going to pray for you. Father God, I pray for everyone whose hands are lifted up right now, Lord. Would you do surgery on our hearts right now, God? Even as we do communion, as we um, close the service here, Father God, I pray, Lord, that you would do what only you can do in giving us new hearts, hearts that love you with everything we have, God. I pray that there would be no area that's untouched by you in your hand, God. I pray, Lord, that you would take everything from our minds to our emotions, to our desires, to our goals, every area we put on the throne of, of the cross and the cross, God, and we declare, Lord, that we want you to have it, Lord. It's only safe in your hands. And so anything else we try to fill the void, God, is worthless and it will not satisfy us. Only you will, Lord. So thank you, Lord, and I pray um, for every person, Lord, whose hand is raised. Um, I also want to pray for people who feel like God has called them to do something, but they have not been obedient. God has given you a task or uh, something to, to physically do, um, but you just haven't done it. You've been... Um, selfish and wanting to do your things your own way, um, I would pray for you too. Um, and, and finally, I want to pray for people uh, just to give their strength. These kind of go together. So I'm going to pray for everybody here. I pray, Lord, over every single person in this room, Father God, that you would give us a supernatural strength, God. I pray, Lord, that you would give us the strength to not just be convicted in our hearts, but live it out, God. Um, I pray that for God-sized dreams and visions and, and aspirations and passions to, to overcome us, Lord, things that are God-sized, um, God, that we would worship you and live out this muchness, Lord, that, that, that we read about, Father God. I pray, Lord, that we would not just be sayers of the word, but doers also and do mighty things around us, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. I would ask that if you gave your heart to the Lord or want to continue praying over that, we are going to have prayer teams at the end of service to pray for you, including myself. And we want to pray for your heart. We also want to pray for anything else that you might have. Um, what we're going to do now, though, is we're going to go into communion. And communion is a time that Jesus says that, you know, every time you gather, decide to do communion, that's uh, remember what Jesus did on the cross, um, you know, to, to remember what he's done. Um, on the cross, that he died for our sins, that he shed his blood for us so that we could have access to God.
Um, and so that's what communion's about. And if you've never done it with us, uh, what we're going to do is um, kind of go through. You're going to be dismissed by row. Uh, you're going to pick up the elements and you're going to go back to your seat. And then when you're done, we're going to pray over each of the elements and we're going to all take them together. But before we do, um, we're all sinners in need of a Savior. And we need to confess our sins. Okay? And um, I want to read this confession of sin. I hope that we have it up. Uh, but it's a confession of sin. Do we have it, guys? Hope so. If not, that's cool. Um, we will we'll say our own confession of sin. Um, let's uh, just raise your hand up and we'll do this together. Um, just repeat after me. Father God. Father God. I am sorry for my sins with all my heart. Sorry, in choosing to do wrong and failing to do good, I have sinned against you, whom I should love above all things. I firmly intend, with the help of your spirit, to sin no more and to avoid whatever leads me to sin. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, suffered and died for us. In his name, my God, have mercy. Amen. And just like that, our sins are washed away, and, and we can approach the throne of God um, because he, he did it for us already. So what we're going to do is um, dismiss you row by row. The ushers are going to come forward. We're going to sing um, a song here, and then we're going to pray over the elements and take them together. We have Sandy and Courtney here going to help us pray over the elements. These ladies love children. Uh, degreed school teacher here, but they help us primarily here at church in our infant through preschool program, and they're, they're saints. So I'm going to ask them to help us pray over the elements. Go ahead, Sandy. Gracious Father, we just thank you, Father God, for dying on the cross for us, Father God. It is through your brokenness, Father, that we're, we're able to receive eternal life, Lord, and be made whole, Father God. Thank you for having mercy on us, Father, when we didn't deserve it, Father. Thank you for allowing us to come into relationship with you yes. on a daily basis, Father God. For healing us, Father. For receiving the gift of healing, Father, on I'm just seeing you heal not just one but so many Father God for the privilege Father of serving you wherever you send Father God forgive us though Father there are days that we're tired and weary Father but we love you with our whole heart and we go we just say thank you Father God for loving us when we're so unloved I love a Please take the bread. Dear Lord, we just thank you again for just another Sunday to come here in this building. We thank you that you've anointed this place and that your Holy Spirit continues to show up every time that we ask you to. Lord, we just pray and declare the blood of Jesus over every heart in this room, over every sickness, over hopeless situations, over anything, God, that we didn't put a voice to, we didn't put a name to today, Lord, that the blood of Jesus reigns over that. Amen. And we thank you that that was given to us freely. And I pray that over everyone throughout this week, that they remember that this was a gift that was given to them. It's not something they earned, and it's not something that they deserve, and it's not something they can work to continue to achieve. God, your blood was a gift to us, and we thank you so much for that. Please drink the juice. And now we always want to send you out with a blessing. It's not just a positive thought. It's an actual spiritual entity that you can be blessed if you want it. So if you want it, I bless you this week with your muchness. Really, somebody could come up and ask you, what's your superpower? <laughs> is every one of us has it. We have a superpower. And I bless you, if you don't know what it is, with the ability this week to find out what it is yeah. and to walk in it. In the name of Jesus, I bless you with that. Yeah. 
Okay, we have, uh, if you're new to us, we have, well, our prayer teams are coming. We have a meet the staff meeting. You came on a good day. It happens once a month. The meet the staff is in the youth room right across the foyer. God bless you. It's going to be a great week. We're going to have a good Monday night prayer tomorrow night. See you.